in my face. It's biology with Mr. V. Biology with Mr. V. That's me. It's me. So today's webinar, today's video, I need to go through the science of classification. And that includes talking about Linnaeus classification, talking about Vos classification. So they're two different scientists, both named Carl. And also the links to evolutionary trees, which links to task eight in your adaptation classification booklet. You're going to want that booklet next to you uh, throughout the, throughout this, really. I'm also, yeah, I'm going to review task eight in the booklet. That's the task that was to do with this topic. And I found a couple of extra questions that I want to expose you to. There isn't many GCC questions to classification because it's, it's, it's new to the new specification. But I found one that I'd like to share. What I have got, though, is a bucket load of A-level questions. And there's only one that I'm going to share with you, because it is one that you guys can do, but it's just quite clever. Right. So I'm going to actually, I'm not going to read through this. What I'm actually going to do here is actually show you, this is the main bit that where we'll be working. For me, you should, especially whilst you do independent study, you should be all about the booklet, all about those learning objectives in the front of that booklet, the spec points. The stuff I'm going through today is everything in this classification bit. So all this 4.6.4, Linnaean systems, evidence-based things where VOSA's domain system comes in and the evolutionary trees. So it's just this bit, much smaller than that first bit, isn't it? Much, much smaller. So let's go back here. Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish scientist, he thought to himself, if I've got loads of different organisms, plants, animals and such, how can I structure them? Effectively, he was just quite sad and liked putting things in groups. Like when I was two, I liked putting all my toy cars in colour order because, you know, I'm really cool. So Carl Linnaeus was just as cool as me. Originally, he thought there were only two kingdoms, animals and plants. If he saw something green, he just presumed it was a plant. He didn't have a microscope, couldn't actually look like the DNA or how it was different. And he classified organisms into a pattern. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I have to stress with you this. The biggest thing that you need for your GCC in the whole thing of classification is to remember that order. There's only been a couple of years of exams and on every single year there has been a classification question where a couple marks is dedicated simply for you guys knowing the order. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. If you don't walk into an exam without that recall, without that knowledge, you're not going to get anywhere. And the mnemonic is a really easy way to do it. Got a nice question here. Do we need to remember the animalia bit as well? You absolutely should know the names of the five kingdoms. You do not need to know any specific phylums, classes, orders, and so on, but you should know the five kingdoms animal, plant, fungi, prokaryote, and protist. You should know those five. Okie dokie. The second bit of knowledge here are oh, animals are always named by what we call our bone binomial system. Bi means two, nomial means name. So two name system. And we always use the genus and the species. So in that example we've got at the top here, well, the actual name of a tiger, if you went to see it in the zoo, it would call it the Panthera tigris. Notice that Panthera is with a capital P and the species name tigris is all in lowercase. That is an important rule that you must follow. Genus species is the binomial name. The genus always has a capital letter and the species is always fully lowercase. There is another little potential rule that you might want need to follow here. When we have our binomial names, And I'm going to do the humans. So humans is Homo sapien. Our genus is Homo. Our species name, 
sapien. If you were to do this, writing, you would actually underline it. Binomial names would be underlined. If you were to do it on a computer, so if you have access to laptops in your exams, you actually find it would your binomial names would be in italics. In the same way, if I go back to my PowerPoint, notice how, because this is on a computer, notice how Panther, Tigris, and Homo sapien have been written in italics. So that yellow box of rules, you do need to follow it, I'm afraid. Welcome to the first poll that Mr. Bateson has made. So boys and girls, this is a very difficult question. Linnaeus came up with five kingdoms. They were plant, animal, fungi, prokaryote. And what was the other? And close it. Congratulations to the 95% of you who put protist, protist. So next bit, poll number two, number two. Are you ready? A kingdom is the first level of Linnaeus classification. What's the fourth? Can you remember the order? And we close it. 80% of you say in order, 9% saying family, 4% phylum, 7% saying genus. Let's just very quickly show it, prove it. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So if kingdom was number one, two, three, four. Correct answer was order. So there were a couple of other tasks in this PowerPoint. Again, if you've done it, then find your work and we'll very quickly go through. Go through with a green pen. That'll be absolutely fab. If you ain't done it yet, well, you, I still need you to do it, even though I'm going to go sort of just talk about it now. Um, this is the type of question that you might see in a GCC exam for two marks. I'm not saying it's a difficult question. It should be an easy two marks for people going into the exam with some knowledge behind you. So by knowing the name for giant panda, you wouldn't be expected to know that. You wouldn't instantly be expected to know what a giant panda is. You're not expected to know any classification names, binomial names, other than probably Homo sapien, come exam time. But you are expected to know kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So filling in this left-hand side should be a doddle. The right-hand side might be a little bit more tricky. But you should appreciate that this is the animal kingdom. Cordata, by the way, just means backbone. And then class. So something that's below a vertebrate, but above a carnivore. So the class is where we get mammal, mammalian. Or if it was like a crocodile, it'd be reptile, or a frog would be amphibian in this part here. <clears throat> but again, you can green pen that as you want, as you will, in your own time. And again, uh, Miss Hall, when she made this, she's put other little examples that you can have a go at classifying different organisms using the information that you're given. It's a really, it's a really good thing to do, a really good sort of question to do. And again, she's giving it there so you can green pen it in your own time. So, boys and girls, this is my A-level question. There is nothing in this question that you cannot do except potentially the very last one. Because I'm not I'm not spoke to you about domains, but if you've already looked looked at that work, you might actually know what a domains, the three domains from Colvos actually are. All this is, is this is a passage about water bears. If you know what water bears are, they're, called, they're all sometimes called tardigrades. Uh, water bears are the ones where like, they can survive in any any sort of situation. There are water bears on the moon as we speak just sitting there doing nothing. This question is not in your booklet. This is an extra one that I've just put into my PowerPoint and to this webinar for you, because you're special. Thank you for tuning in. So I promise you, the only thing you need knowledge-wise for this question is the order. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. If you've got that, you can answer this, I promise. The water bear, that is its binomial name. Again, if you know what the binomial name is, you'll know 
whether Echinitius is the kingdom phylum class or the family genus or the species. You'll know whether Trisotosis is the kingdom phylum class or the family genus species. You can do this. So I'm going to give you the poll and then I'm going to go through it all. So we'll, we'll have the explanation, we'll go through, we'll get the right answers. So my poll is, let's actually find it. So this is the order of answers that hopefully you've got, hopefully you've written down. Hopefully at least one of them matches what you did. <laughs> it might not. Um, if it, you've got one that matches what you did, whichever matches it may be closest. Okie dokie, I'm going to close that one there. Good news is the vast majority of you did put the second answer. So let's actually try and explain what is actually going on here. Okay, so I'm going to go through one at a time and then I'll answer the questions that you asked me as well. The water bear, Echinitius trisotosis, is a member of the genus. Well, if its name is Eshi, well, I'll just spell that, Niscus trisotosis. This is a binomial name. So that one is the genus and that one is the species. So your first answer, the answer for the first blank is Eshi Niscus. That's how we know what the genus and species are. If you know what a binomial name is, it's just the first, it's just the first word. And then says that it's also part of the family Echinitia Day. Good for it. The family belongs to the something Echinitia Coidae. Well, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So if I know what the family is, Echiniscoidea, well, that belongs to the order. Belongs to the order, Echiniscoidae. Sorry, I've written, I've written the order there on this one. The family, haven't I? Its family name was Echinitia Day. Echinitia Day. There you go. That's incredibly scruffy, but there it is. So the family was Echinitia Day, and the family therefore belongs to the order Echinitia Coidae. So the answer number two was order. The third one. Um, this this order, Echinitia which forms part of a class, Heterotardigrada. Water bear, also known as tardigrades, are classified into a blank of their own called tardigrada. So again, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We know the species, Trisotosis. We know the genus, Echinitia. We know the family, Echinitia day, day. We know the order, Echinitia coidae. Wow. We know the class. Heterotardigrada. And then they're classified into something of their own. Well, that something of their own must be the next step. So that third one is phylum. Has to be. They've got a phylum of their own called Tardigrada. And yep, Tardigrades form part of the kingdom. Um, these are water bears. So the clue bear hopefully gives it away. This is an animal. You appreciate the water bears are like microscopic, like like mites. They are absolutely teeny tiny, can only skin to a microscope. These aren't giant bears that we're sending to the moon. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, do you need to underline each part of the classification? No, only genus. Only genus would be underlined. But as you can see, it's already got underline. It's already got dots, doesn't it? Underlining it, so you wouldn't lose marks in an exam if you didn't underline it. In that lucky. Uh, the last one, uh, within the domain, and again, you might not have looked at domains yet, it's what I'm going to talk about in a sec. Uh, the domain in this case was eukaryote, uh, because animals are all eukaryotic, remember that from your cell structure. So other little uh, questions that I've had here, uh, one of you has just asked for a list of all the different kingdoms. Um, it was on the PowerPoint slide just before, but there's five, so there's the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, fungi, Prokaryote, which is just the posh name for the bacterial kingdom. And then you've also got your protists, which you might remember. Um, protists, for example, ones that cause malaria from the, from the disease topic. I've had a question, what about eukaryotes? Uh, eukaryotes aren't a kingdom. 
the four kingdoms, animal, plant, fungi and protist, or all four of them are eukaryotes. All four of them are eukaryotes. But that's what we're going to discuss. We'll discuss that. We'll go through that in more detail when I do domains. Now, for this next bit, you're going to want to find your booklet and you're going to want to find task eight. I'm going to go through task eight in this next little bit. Okay, look. <clears throat> Classification is actually useful. I promise. It's not just for sad scientists going, oh, I want to put things in groups because I'm sad. No, it, it has actually got a useful purpose. We classify, yes, to organize things, to make it easier for a worldwide access, but we also classify because we need to classify to help our understanding about evolutionary links. If you can classify and you stick to the rules of classification that Linnaeus put in for us, for kingdom, final class, order, family, genus, species. If you look at two organisms classification lists, you can actually work out how closely related they are from a common ancestor. You can, you can almost work out how closely related they are to do with evolution. So in this example here, we've got Sumatran orangutans, Borneo orangutans, and then humans in the middle. We know that these three are incredibly related because they have the same kingdom, same phylum, same class, same order, and even the same family. We then know that humans are not as related to Borneo orangutans compared to Sumatran next to Borneo, because Sumatran and Borneo orangutans have even the same genus, Pongo, which by the way, is just a brilliant genus name. Humans are different. So in this, out of these three, Sumatran and Borneo orangutans are the closely, most closely related. They have the, the, they have the most recent common ancestor. Whereas humans, although clearly very related, having the same family, have clearly evolved their common ancestors slightly further back because they've got a different genes. Now you might be thinking, how the monkey do we know whether something is the same family or genus? Yeah, we look at an anatomical structures, what they look like. The real scientists look at the biochemical nature as well. We look at the DNA. We look at molecules, enzymes that they use in respiration. Because enzymes in respiration, they, they, they've been conserved throughout history. If an enzyme like changes shape by a mutation, then the enzyme won't work because enzymes are specific. And therefore, that oh, if it's one enzyme for respiration, they can't respire, which means they can't release energy, which means they die. So looking at the biochemical properties actually gives us really good understanding about evolution. It helps us classify, and classification helps us understand evolutionary histories. So there was a nice example of pandas and red pandas. That's what this diagram is here for, um, showing an evolutionary tree between them. Because clearly, pandas and red pandas must be linked. They must have some quite close evolution, but how close? So I am going to go through task eight, because you can just read. If you haven't done it, well, oh well, it's not going to hurt. If you have done it, well, you can green pen mark it. Um, and obviously, you can go back to where I ever, when I saved on YouTube, you can go back and, uh, and look at it then. So drawing a ring around the correct answers. Now you've not done about Darwin yet. So maybe these are these questions are maybe slightly harsh. But let's see what we came up with. Darwin's just theory of evolution here is by natural selection. Darwin's theory was natural selection. And he says that all living things have evolved from simple life forms. We all started incredibly simple, like single-celled organisms, and we've become more and more complex over time, billions of years. Most scientists believe first life first developed about three billion years ago, three billion years ago. And Darwin's theory of evolution was only slowly accepted by other people. And we've got to give two reasons why it was only slowly accepted by other people. So let me talk religion then. You can have an answer about religion. But it's not because they're religious. It's because most religious people at the time believed a different thing. They believed in another theory of how life came to be. They believed in the creationism, creation theory. It's not the fact they were religious. It's because they had a pre-existing belief, creationism. 
the pre-existing belief. Now we've got evolutionary trees. So this is a relationship here between, oh, a relationship between whales, cows, hippos, pigs, and camels. Oh, they're all cute mammals. Um, the model shown is an evolutionary, so yeah, that's an evolutionary tree. So tree for one mark is there. Which two animals are the most closely related? Well, the ones that are most closely related have a common ancestor that is closest together. So hippos and pigs, their common ancestor is this little bit here where they link together. That is closer than the relationship of any other two. So hippos and pigs are the two most closely related. Uh, the two least closely related are camels and whales. The question I've been given is, and I would listen to this one, how do you get a whale from a camel? You don't. Don't ever believe, and this, this is actually what a lot of the people in the 1800s did to basically smear Darwin. They spread around the lie, the rumour that Darwin believed that humans have evolved from apes. No, that's not true. Camels have not evolved from whales. Whales have not evolved from camels. What an evolution tree shows is how closely they once were the same species, a common ancestor. So this dot here where they're together, that was a completely different organism before whales, cows, hippos, pigs, camels even existed. There was a completely different organism here, which again, we're talking billions of years ago, potentially, which over many, many millions, over millions of generations has changed so much that now we have whales and we have camels. It is evolution is such a difficult thing to think about because it's so big. And in our lifetimes, we can only see such little changes. I agree, it probably was a wacky organism. Well, it wasn't. If th this organism here is going to give rise to whales, cows, hippos, pigs, and camels, isn't it not just a generic mammal? Isn't it not just probably a four leg generic mammal? So slightly furry, giving a bit of milk out. Some of its and some of its ancestors, millions of years later, is crawled back into the ocean. Some of it started mooing. Where well, whales do still have legs. If you ever look at the bone structure of whales' fins, they actually still have fingers and toes. Okie dokie. Uh, this last question, I think it's the last question here. It might not be. I think there's one more after this. Um, Diagram 2 shows more recent module relationship between the animals, uh, whale, cow, hippo, camel, pig. Um, this is what we now know. We now know that the common ancestors of all five is down here, but actually cows and hippos, are in, we know that they are far more closely related compared to, like, compared to a cow and a pig. How do we know this? How have we been able to change our understanding? We've changed our understanding not because of computers, not because of new species, because we have more evidence. We have more fossil evidence, we have more DNA evidence, we've got more biochemical evidence. Okie dokie. So I've got a last sort of question here. Uh, it shows evolution tree for humans. The diagram is based on the study of fossils. So again, it's an evolution tree. Um, this is the earliest organism here. Notice we haven't got any links between these. They're so old, we probably don't have the fossil records or any, we definitely don't have any DNA evidence to suggest that they are actually related. We just know how old they are. We start to be able to link them at this bit, Australopithecus anamensis. That seems to be the oldest of all these human related organisms. So when did Australopithecus afarensis first appear? When did it first appear? Australopithecus first appears just have to find it it's there so that is between three and four million years ago it looks about 3.3 well, 3.4 million years ago uh, those answering questions in particular those who ask questions about evolution based facts um, I'll do that after these questions but do ping them across now answer them all at the end of these questions uh, which species was the direct ancestor of Paranthropus boise? Uh, there's Paranthropus boise. Its direct answer, just follow the chain. Its direct answer was Paranthropus atheopicus. Uh, 
Which species is most closely related to Homo habilis? So again, we find Homo habilis. There it is. Most closely related, follow the chain. Well, there's nothing down here, bless. We don't know its common ancestor, but we do know that Homo ergaster is relatively related. So Homo ergaster, most closely related. Okay, uh, you're asked uh, oh, just a question about Homo erectus. About 250 fossils of Homo erectus have been found. 50 of them have been found in China. A Chinese scientist suggested the hypothesis that Chinese people evolved from Homo erectus. Most scientists do not agree with that information, with that hypothesis. Use the information above and from the diagram to suggest two reasons why. Let's use the information above first. Apparently, Chinese people evolved from Homo erectus. Yet only 50 of the fossils out of 250 found in China. What about all the 200 fossils? Not all the fossils were found in China. That's evidence as to why um, why that Chinese scientist is probably wrong. If I now go, now go across to this, if I look at Homo erectus, which is here, well, there is no link between Homo erectus and Homo sapien. So he said this hypothesis was that Chinese people, which we pres well, I presume, oh no, they are definitely Homo sapiens. <laughs> oh God, um, they are definitely Homo sapiens. Well, if they evolved from if, if Homo sapiens evolved from Homo erectus, you would have a you would have a line, you'd have an arrow joining the two together. They did not. Homo sapiens evolved from Homo heidelbergensis, then Homo muriti, whatever that says, and then Homo ergaster. They did not come from Homo erectus. So there's your two reasons there. So first reason, not all the fossils found in China. Second reason, Homo erectus, I'm sorry, Homo sapiens did not evolve from Homo erectus. They evolved from Homo ergaster instead. Uh, this second quiz two mark here, by the way, is exactly the same as the one we saw right at the start of task eight. It was a long time because people already had pre-existing beliefs, creation theory. They didn't have enough uh, DNA evidence or fossil evidence. Okay, I've, I've only got a couple of questions. Firstly, one of you has asked, is this part two? Yes, this is part two of Adaptations Classification Booklet, the second the part two of help. The second question was, is evolution that humans evolved from apes? or that humans and apes have a common ancestor. It is absolutely that humans and apes have a common ancestor. Humans have not evolved from apes. So Linnaeus only believed there were two kingdoms, animals and plants, but now we know there's at least five. We know that because of improvements in microscopes. We understand biochemical processes like DNA. We understand DNA much better. And because um, therefore we've created new kingdoms and even new models. The model you need to be aware of, and this is the model that we that actual scientists use, is the domain system. Um, I'll, I'll very quickly go through the PowerPoint, but then I want to kind of I want to kind of draw it so you can actually see it. I don't think the PowerPoint does this justice. Colvos did a lot of biochemical research about organisms' DNA and also organisms enzymes so biochemical and he develops basically he actually his main sort of science was he looked at the bacteria kingdom the prokaryote kingdom and he discovered when looking at their dna that actually between the just in the bacteria kingdom there is such a significant difference of their biochemistry in such a way that there were some types of this bacterial kingdom that were so different to others they were biochemically as different as a mammal is to a bacteria. So he, instead of using the five kingdoms, he classified all the organisms into three domains. Eukaryotes, so all organisms with uh, true nucleus, organisms with uh, membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria. That was pretty straightforward. But it's this bit where he made his, where he made his money. There were some types of bacteria that were really, really primitive, usually lived in very extreme environments. You might remember the term extremophile from part one of this topic. And he called them archae. 
So they're really simple, really primitive, and lives in very extreme environments like really high temperatures. And then there were the other types of bacteria, the ones that like live inside human beings, live inside organism, uh, other organisms. And he called them eubacteria. You can just call them bacteria. Now, what a lot of students tend to find a little bit difficult is the link between those three domains and the five kingdoms. So hopefully I'll be able to draw this for you. Colvosis, three domains. Eukaryote, archae, and bacteria. That was his three domains. If I draw the kingdoms underneath, well, animals are eukaryotes, plants are eukaryotes, fungi are eukaryotes, protists are eukaryotes, but the prokaryotes, and this is the weird bit, the prokaryotes, despite kingdoms being lower than domains, there's only one kingdom in the two domains of archaea and bacteria. So there are four kingdoms that make up the domain eukaryote. There's actually only one kingdom that makes up the two domains archaea and bacteria. Have a go at that question. It's not in your booklet. This is an extra one that I found from a 2018 GCSE paper. So you can have a look at that whilst I'm maybe answering a few extra questions that people are getting. Yes, vote structure came a long time after the Linnaeus system. Uh, the domain system is actually above the kingdom. Domain is above kingdom. I'm just going to exit this PowerPoint so I can get my remark board and just do a bit more drawings. So if you put Vos and Linnaeus, I'm going to spell Linnaeus wrong and I am, together, domain actually comes first, then kingdom, then phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, what I'm just going to do very quickly, I'm going to redraw it all the way out, but this time I'll write the terms in as well. So the very highest form of classification is Colvos's domain system. And there are three. There's eukaryotes, archaea, and bacteria. Underneath that, we've got the kingdoms. So in the eukaryote, there are four kingdoms. There's the animals, plants, fungi, and the protists. The archaea and the bacteria only actually have one kingdom underneath them. And that's the prokaryote kingdom. The, what you need to be able to do you should know what the three domains are, eukaryote, archaea, bacteria. You should know what kingdoms belong to those domains. So you should know that eukaryote domain has four kingdoms, animal, plant, fungi, protists. You should absolutely know that it is, in terms of domains, you should know that is Colvos who's responsible for that, in the same way that you should know Linnaeus is responsible for the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, gene, species. So I'll just have a look at this question then. Firstly, it is a describe question. You should like describe questions. It doesn't require it doesn't require you to explain anything. It just requires you to state facts. So you don't need to go into lots and lots of detail. You just need to state the ideas, state the facts, state what you see. So the three domain system of classification first. So there should be some sort of statement that it is. consists of a eukaryote domain, an archaea domain, and a bacteria domain. So, so literally as nicely as that, sort of just going over, describe the three domain system classification, so just describing what the three are, that's great. But here's the bit I would have liked you to say. 
the domain system has been made by analyzing biochemical structures of the organisms. For example, by analyzing the DNA. That's what makes it different to Linnaeus. Linnaeus only looks at like observable features. Oh, they've both got arms, put them together. But Vos actually looked at the biochemistry at the DNA. Right, there is one final thing to do on this webinar. That's poll number four. So boys and girls, you have a final question. Are you ready? Are you steady? What did Colvos use to further develop the classification system? Did he use biochemical evidence such as DNA, geological evidence such as rocks, fossil evidence, or this webinar because it's been so good? So Mr. Colvos, um, he absolutely looked at biochemical evidence such as DNA. That's what he actually did. If he was alive today, uh, obviously he would have used this webinar instead. Fossil evidence, not so much. Colvos's domain system is famous for the biochemical evidence. Right, I'll very quickly just finish off what I've got on here. There was an extension video to look for a little bit further about the idea of domains. So if you're still a bit unsure, it's a really good thing to do. There was an extension and a challenge as well using an article, using a little bit of research, should you get chance, should you get time, which would be really cool. So that's all I've got. Have a good one.